We are the hub for electronic vehicle manufacturing in the country. We're kind of like the Detroit of EVs. Detroit's not like that anymore, but back in the day when Detroit was the hub, that's us. You know, we're, we're competing now with states like Texas for big projects. We have a mega project every month announced here in Arizona. People want to be here. Welcome to Consensus in Conversation, a new podcast from Consensus Digital Media. I'm Connor Gaughan, publisher here at Consensus and host of The Pod, where we talk to leaders who have built organizations and careers that do well while doing good. Today, we're talking to Danny Seiden. He's had a storybook career, starting in Disney World, to law school, and then into public service, where he worked as a trusted advisor to Arizona's governor. Today, as the head of the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, he's truly a CEO of CEOs, helping a state and private sector that is leading innovation around sustainability, and most notably, the critical issue of water conservation. Danny has a unique perspective, watching Arizona businesses make a big positive impact on the state's biggest issues, all while these companies are seeing a big impact on their own bottom line. Hey, Danny, how's it going? Hey, Connor. It's going well. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. You see, you are the CEO of an organization that represents businesses and CEOs, Mm -hmm. and would love to hear more about the chamber, the mission, the members you represent. Give us kind of a a sneak peek at at the chamber's business. Our mission really is to be the collective voice of the business community down at the state capitol, back in Washington, D.C., and at local levels. So, um, you know, just the history of chambers and commerce is that businesses came together and realized they had a big problem they had to deal with, and they were better suited to do it as a broad coalition as opposed to by themselves. So that's us. We're the broad coalition of business interests. And whether it's a you know free market, anti-regulatory, uh, better legal atmosphere, you know, kind of tort reform, we take on a lot of big issues, a lot of big labor issues right now too. You know, we're, we're protecting our at-will employment and right to work status here in Arizona. So um, those are a lot of what we work on. What matters to our employers, it, it runs the gambit uh, from tax reform, keeping us as the most globally competitive, making us the number one state in the country to start a business, relocate your business, or grow a business. And I think we've done such a good job at that here in Arizona. We have a great business-minded governor with Governor Doug Ducey, who came from the business world, who's CEO of Cold Stone Creamery. So he gets it. He's uh, one of us. He's an ally when it comes to advertising how great Arizona is. And we're, we're competing now with states like Texas for big projects. We have a mega project every month announced here in Arizona. People want to be here. I tend to see the private sector and, and corporate America as a huge catalyst for making good change and using innovation to make a better world, a better country, better, better communities. Arizona seems to be ground zero for growth, but tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So politically speaking, in the political atmosphere, the business community finds itself in kind of a new territory. You know, we used to have a strong base over in the Republican Party, and the Democrats usually favored raising taxes and regulations. Now what's happened, and we're a blissfully nonpartisan organization, I should say, the extremes on both sides are really anti-business. And so we have to carve out that middle for us and make sure that people understand like, hey, when you see the fact that I'm sitting right now in Maricopa County, the fastest growing county in the country, that's because of the business climate we've created. That's because our employers are here. You know, it's because Intel is investing another 20 billion in new fabs here. TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, they're doing 12 billion. I'm sure it's going to be more. That's a massive site. There's more cranes over their site right now than I've ever seen in my life. We are growing so fast because of our total environment. We're not a state that writes big checks in the terms of incentives. It's just creating the environment for companies to come in and succeed. And it's worked. And I, I think that, again, we have a unique brand as Arizona businesses. We're known for being uh, open to opportunity for all. 73% of our state is from somewhere else. And what that lends itself to is this state becoming really like a meritocracy. That You can come from anywhere. doesn't matter where you went to school or who your parents are. You can come here, succeed, and have a great future. There's a couple examples that have really jumped out to me the last few months thinking about Arizona companies or, or innovation in Arizona, in particular, groups that are really doing incredible stuff towards a more sustainable future. Obviously, the EV sector is booming in terms of customer demand and 
manufacturing growth across the country. We'd love to hear a little bit more about the growth and opportunity that Arizona is showing in the EV space. So Nuco is a great example. We just toured the opening of their assembly line and they are selling and putting these electronic semi trucks out. And it's one of those things, again, that sounds science fiction until you go sit in one and ride and realize, A, it sounds like a golf cart, but it moves like a semi and it's fast. It has pickup. It's great for the environment. And yeah, it's made right here in Arizona. When they were looking at where they wanted to go, they saw the work that we were doing with disruptive technologies. We really got our foot in the door with autonomous vehicles. And they saw this as a friendly regulatory environment for things that are new. We have uh, battery manufacturers coming because when you have the manufacturers, the supply chain wants to be nearby. So we're building out that whole ecosystem of electronic vehicles. We are the hub for electronic vehicle manufacturing in the country. We're kind of like the Detroit of EVs. Detroit's not like that anymore, but back in the day when Detroit was the hub, that's us. You know, we're, we're, we're just crushing it in this area. Just advanced tech manufacturing has found a nice niche in Arizona, and we're going to continue to expand upon that. Beyond the EV ecosystem finding a home in Arizona, I've followed some of the cool sustainability initiatives around water at Intel. You actually worked there, right? Yeah. So what can you tell us about the issue in the state and how the company is addressing it? Intel, great chamber member. You know, I always have to disclose I'm a former employee of Intel in their global public affairs department. And you talked about water, so I'll just start there. Intel came in with the goal of being water neutral, I believe by 2030, they're beating that goal. They're going to be water positive by 2030. And what that means is they're treating uh, wastewater at their facility, um, which they built and gave back to the city they're at now. It's it's fantastic to see that. And it took a lot to get to that 100% water neutral and eventually to water positivity. They realized that you can only do so much in a self-contained manufacturing hub. So they went out to their neighboring communities, some neighboring farms is a really good example. There was a high water crop farm down in the Verde Valley and Intel went in and offered to help them switch from their crop to hops. And hops use way less water. You don't have to do flood irrigation. They make that switch. And now Arizona has its first ever Arizona-based hops. And we, we have kind of what we call the Intel beer. But they really are leaders. You could give them the Corporate Citizen of the Year Award every year if you wanted. They just they care about what the neighbors think. They care about their footprint. This is not because the state or federal government forces them to do it. They are doing this on their own, exercising their own leadership. And it's the way the market is right now. The more and more you look at if you're a manufacturer like Apple or Microsoft, you're starting to require your downstream to be produced cleanly. So the market is setting these uh, requirements, not anybody else. Awesome. Arizona-based hops. I love it. You have some Arizona beer next time you're here. Uh, you beat me to my next question. So we actually produce a video series called Made in America, Glass Half Full. little plug there. You can check it out on youtube.com slash consensus digital media, but we'll also add it to the show notes. Um, we recently filmed this episode at Four Peaks Brewing in Phoenix. Four Peaks is a great story. And all the cool sustainability initiatives they've got going on there. So I'm, I'm curious, what's your favorite local beer? Uh, I mean, oh gosh. You know, I feel like I have to say Kilt Lifter because it's the one that made the Arizona beer scene. They're, that's the Four Peaks big one that sold to the point where we had to literally had to change state law. And um, that all started with Kilt Lifter. So I'll go with Kilt Lifter from Four Peaks. I mean, Four Peaks is really done a ton of great, cool, innovative stuff in sustainability as well. Curious if you've got any kind of takes on the exciting stuff that they're up to. They're known for their water conservation efforts. They're known for how they interact with uh, their community. You know, Four Peaks sold to a larger um, national corporation. When they were buying Four Peaks, I imagine they looked at them and said, this would look great on our CSR and ESG reports because this is a company that does look at conservation of water, that does care about their footprint and does brew in a way that conserves energy and water. So yeah, I think they had the goal, if I remember right, of making the state better than when they found it. And they really live up to that. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much innovation coming out of the state. And I think I saw the other day that five of the fastest growing cities in the country are in Arizona. People are, are flocking. I know so many friends had made the short commute from the LA and Southern California area to Arizona. Give us your, your hypothesis. Why is it happening? What's driving it? Uh, we talk about this a lot. You know, By the time we're done with this podcast, 300 more people have moved to Arizona. So it's 
growing that rapidly. And the, the biggest net migration we have in the Wall Street Journal just did a really good story on this is coming from California. I mean, you can track Florida's picked up most of their new population from New York. We're picking up Californians. That's okay. As we like to say, as long as you remember why you left. And the reason why I believe that's happening is, well, I'll attribute it to George Will because he most recently wrote it, that capital goes where it's most wanted and stays where it's most loved. And that's true for people. That's true for resources. And what we've shown in Arizona is we want your capital. We want your human capital, as well as your you know uh, capital investments in the traditional sense. And if you come here, we will make this place the best to live, work, retire, get an education, raise a family. And you know we're keeping people safe. Okay. Let's hear the rest of the sales pitch. Side note, if you were to knock on my door selling something, I am buying for sure. We have just passed the lowest flat tax in the country. Our state uh, revenues are up as a result of lowering taxes and our population is up. So people vote with their feet and they're voting with their wallets too. I mean, we're winning on all accounts. Yeah. Obviously, this summer has been brutal. The drought in the West is reaching dire levels. The Colorado River, which is a critical water supply for Arizona and the entire region, has been particularly hard hit. What's Arizona, the chamber and the business community working on regarding this water crisis. Are there any innovative solutions that you've seen from the Arizona business community? I just came back from a trade mission to Israel with the governor, with the secretary of commerce in Arizona, and a few other key stakeholders. And one of the primary reasons we went was to study how Israel was doing their water augmentation, because they're past conservation. And a lot of it's coming from desalinization, which some people view as a science fiction level technology, because it it just seems unreal that you're going to pull seawater out and drink it. But, you know, while in Israel, I went to the Mediterranean Sea, visited a desalinization plant and drank a cup of water from the Mediterranean Sea that was in it 90 minutes prior. It's amazing what they're doing. They're environmentally conscious. They do constant environmental studies on what the brine deposits looks like. And I think that... Arizona right now is looking at an augmentation strategy. We're a well-planned for state because of people like Senator John Kyle and Carl Hayden who came before us. They laid the Arizona Groundwater Management Act. So we've been managing our water very well. We're not having to say, you know, don't take a shower today or we can't put water out on your table. We're, We're nowhere near that yet. We won't be for a long time. To think through an augmentation strategy like desalization, which would probably go down in Mexico, um, in the Sea of Cortez, and we'd have a lot of joint agreements to make that work, I think is fantastic. We also need to work with our farmers to get them to look at moving to drip irrigation technology, something that Israel's done very well, proven scientifically, it yields a higher crop and costs less in terms of fertilization. And fertilizer is one of the highest expenses for farmers right now. So the utilities are leading the way on this, and the business community is at every table working to ensure Arizona remains a good steward of its water. Beyond the water crisis, you've also got a major issue in Arizona in just the heat. You were the first state to have an office of heat management. And I'm wondering if you could expand on the heat problem a little bit more. What's the private sector doing to think about and innovate around this? Yeah. Well, you know, most people need to remember really fast as a I'm going to give a public advertisement for the state of Arizona. We are more than just Phoenix and Maricopa County, which is the primary heat sink, I'll call it, of the state. So, yes, uh, it can get hot here in the summers. It's kind of like a nice dry heat. So you can argue it feels like a warm hug every time you walk out. But in reality, it does get really hot because we have so much concrete in Phoenix that kind of traps it in. And what you mentioned about the city of Phoenix, they're doing a lot of creative things. They're changing the colors of roofs. They're painting over roads in some ways that absorb it better and don't trap it as much, putting more greenery down. So there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate it. But you know, we're a city in the desert. It's going to get hot. We have so many different climates in Arizona. Aaron Flagstaff, it is always 20 plus degrees cooler. You've got mountains, you've got green forests. It's one of the reasons I love the state so much is the geographical diversity that we have. But for those of us who have to stay in the heat, every one of my large businesses that I've talked to recently are putting solar shades on all of their parking lots. I was just at uh, Honeywell and one of their first things on their agenda is to cover their parking lot and solar panels, which you know um, helps with heat in cars and then also builds up solar energy for the grid. So it's a a win-win on that. And you're seeing that in almost every parking lot in Arizona now, more and more solar shade coming in. So there's clearly a ton going on within the Arizona Chamber of Commerce among your members. And there's also a lot of talk these days around ESG. It's a really hot subject, Uh, as is clean technology. It's one of the hottest places for venture capital to go. 
When you think about the trends in financial and capital markets, how do you see all this playing out specifically in relation to what you've got going on in Arizona? From what I've seen, the ESG savvy companies, especially those mid-level suppliers, they're more likely to win an RFP at a larger company. So really, it's a benefit not only to the environment and outside world, but it also benefits your bottom line because you're more likely to get picked up by an Intel or an APS if you're a socially responsible company. Now, you said it was hot, and that's true. What we are starting to see at the chamber is this push by some elected officials to come after ESG now, which is you know kind of a unique, and we could do a whole separate podcast on this, where they want to try and say that it's some kind of antitrust violation or some sort of weird coercion. And we'll maintain our position that businesses have the private right of contracting and we'll fight for that, that right for them. And if the market chooses to value ESG right now, that's what the market is doing. So attempting to kind of regulate the other way, which is the irony, would be really a mistake. A big theme at Consensus is getting all the players around the table. And some of the major stakeholders in Arizona are the Native American communities. They're a critical part of the policymaking scene and the business scene. What are some of the ways that they're leading when it comes to sustainability and innovation? So our tribal reservations and our tribal governments have traditionally been good stewards of the resources they have. And at the moment, there's some tribal governments that have access to a lot of water. They're at the table talking about, yeah, if you'd like to use our water for your plant, tell us what's your plan? How do you clean it? How do you return it? They find themselves in the middle of a lot of very important discussions around economic development right now and the role that they can play. And I think that's ultimately a good thing that you have someone who cares that much about environmental impact and um, conservation at those tables. I think you probably have a really unique job in that you've got companies and partners and stakeholders that come with lots of perspectives, folks from both parties, folks from a variety of opinions on hot button topics. How do you navigate that? Find consensus among members. Yeah, that's that. That's my job. I mean, that's that, that's the daily battle and the daily challenge, and it's it's an exciting one and one I welcome. You know, we also have on our board the university presidents as well. So um, they're a very important stakeholder. They play a big role, by the way, in a lot of sustainability projects, a lot of sustainability planning, um, a lot of water planning. ASU has a, a center, you know, the Kyle Center for Water, dedicated to this topic um, as is. So they're a great partner to have too. But, you know, they don't always get along with people in the legislature or the business community and vice versa. And every day it's a new challenge. And how do we get them to focus on that, that thing that moves us all together? And that's really the best advice I've ever been able to give when, when dealing with building a broad coalition. There is always a point we can rally around. And instead of bickering over the 20% we disagree on, let's find that 80% issue and, you know, do an education effort around that. Could you give us a couple of examples? We all care about power in Arizona. We want to make sure we have power into the future. And, you know, we need to discuss how we're going to pay for the power that we want here. But getting everyone to support reliability and the need to recoup capital investments from major utilities, that's a universal agreement. We can talk, we can agree on that, we can move on. When it comes to labor, um, labor is an issue, by the way. With every company you talk to right now, they have a labor shortage just about. And our unemployment rate is 3.2%. If you look at the participation rate, it's around the 63, 62 percentile. So it's saying there's you know around 63 people for every 100 jobs right now. That makes the labor market really competitive. And that's why we will do everything we can to make it more beneficial to be an employee in Arizona. So you know, a, a lot of that is, is the stuff we all unite around. Everyone wants to talk about power and water. Those are all big issues we can rally around. I'll I'll go back to ESG. This is probably the perfect example. ESG, there's usually a bill or two in every state legislature right now that wants to punish banks that do lending based on ESG. And we've been able to shut a lot of that down because of the broader principle of private right of contracting. You should be able to choose who you enter into a contract with and why. What we have to watch for is this notion of whoever is in charge is right. It's about the principle. And the principle for us is private right of contracting and the free market. So that's the stuff that's exciting to get out of bed and go to work every day to protect too. If you were to zoom back a little bit and think about some of your previous work, the more political level, anything that you think you could extrapolate or lessons you can apply from 
what you've been able to see and do at the chamber that you think we should be able to think about at, at a civic level? You know, this this theme of is this the worst it's ever been in partisan divide it comes up a lot. I'm, I'm sure, you know, if I live long enough, I'll probably hear this is the worst it's ever been probably five more times in my life. But I'll point to a good example. Arizona is at the forefront of this because our senior center, Senator Kirsten Cinema, worked with Senator Portman of Ohio on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act to pass a bipartisan bill to deal with our infrastructure and critical infrastructure needs, which, by the way, deals with water, energy, and things of that nature. So that proved to me that the greatest deliberative body in the history of our country, which is the United States Senate, can still function and do what it's supposed to do and produce a bipartisan bill that, you know, a lot of people don't like the price tag, but by and large, that was bipartisan. There was stuff for both parties in there, but it benefits the state. I mean, Arizona is going to get a lot of funding for critical water infrastructure as a result of that. And that came about by her working diligently across the aisle. And that press conference was her and Senator Portman standing right next to each other in the forefront. You know, a guy from Republican from Ohio, Democrat from Arizona, they were able to get this done. So we can get this done. We, we, we can find things to, to sit across the aisle, have a conversation and get some things done. And I think I'm very grateful for Senator Cinema for kind of leading the way on that, for not giving up on bipartisanship. She said she's going to be a fierce defender of bipartisanship, and she's really lived up to that promise. Anybody who wants to look to an example, look to the IIJ to see that it's still possible. And when, you're, when your state starts getting these funds and these grants, I'm sure everyone will be really thrilled that they were able to pull that off. I was excited to get you on the podcast because I've been tracking some of the compelling business innovations coming out of Arizona, and you did not disappoint. So I'm leaving feeling super optimistic. I want to give you the last word for an uplifting, hopeful note for our listeners. So what inspiration should folks take away from this episode when it comes to Arizona and the innovation that lies ahead? Yeah, well, I I appreciate the opportunity to do that. You know, the one story that I don't think ever gets told about Arizona is that we didn't get where we are by accident. It was very deliberate. It was very targeted and And I mean that policy matters. The policies that we have been passing in Arizona for the definitely the past seven years with Governor Ducey, the prior um, near four years with Governor Brewer and even Governor Napolitano, they were largely pro-business policies and it set the state up to be competitive. If you go back six years, if a business was going to leave California, it wouldn't even look at Arizona. It would skip right over us and go to Texas. Not only are we competing for those businesses now, we're winning them. We're, we've picked up a business from Texas recently. So, I mean, the environment that we've created through policy, the low tax, low regulatory environment that we've created, it's almost like they think this is happening by accident. We're a state that cares about environmental impact. We're a state that cares about sustainability. And um, the companies have responded. And I got to tell you, as they leave Silicon Valley and come here, they love the good corporate citizen model being set here in Arizona. So, The way you ended that really gets to the heart of why Arizona is winning with innovation. It comes down to values, including being good corporate citizens. They're important to Arizona. They're important to companies, investors, suppliers, customers, partners across the country and beyond. I tend to think it's this complex nexus of stakeholders and shared values that empowers successful innovation. So thank you so much for ending with such an optimistic note. We will certainly be watching all the new innovation coming out of Arizona, and I can't thank you enough for being with us today. Yeah. Well, I don't know how you end up in Washington, D.C. You should have stopped in Arizona and, uh, you know, commuted there. Big shout out to Danny Seiden for this inspiring conversation. Consensus in Conversation is hosted by me, Connor Gaughan. This episode was produced by our very own Will Gatchell and Chandler Bramstead. Executive produced by me with editing by Reasonable Volume. Special thanks to Consensus Creative Director Kate Tucker. See you next week. And don't forget to rate us and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform.